All right. I got, I got to click one thing. Hello, hello. We are live with Dr. We're, we're live with me. <laughs> and I'm so excited. We actually have the tech working tonight. So we're excited because we have Dr. Jill Kraft, esteemed LS researcher and LS specialist, vulvar specialist from the Center of, of, of uh, Center of Vulvovaginal Disorders in Washington, DC. And uh, we're going to be taking your questions. Um, thank you, everybody who has donated. Um, if you feel you have gotten value out of today's sessions, we do operate on donations. So you can just click the button up at the top and add a donation at any time. We truly, truly do appreciate it. And it does help us to keep doing um, events like this. and. Um, our services like the virtual meetups and the provider directories. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kraft. Welcome, Hello. Dr. Kraft. Thank you. I'm excited to be here tonight. Yes, World Lichen Sclerosis Day. I want to say, listen, this is the most um, attention I've seen to World Lichen Sclerosis Day since I started doing awareness. I feel like there are accounts that like, I didn't even really like know about that showed up today and was tagging the network and were was giving, um, you know, shout outs to, to LS. And I was like, yes, amazing, love it. <laughs> it makes me so happy, the awareness that's around this condition, that people are finally talking about this. It really brings the comfort level out. And, you know, people who are suffering in silence can, you know, see that other people have this as well, that there is hope. There are providers that treat this. There are fellow LS warriors out there. And so I think we're just heading in the right direction with everything. I agree 110%. So, um, Guys, please start dropping your questions in the chat. Um, while you guys do that, we do have some that were left over from earlier. So we're just going to go ahead and start with those while, while um, some new ones trickle in. Um, and here we go. So we have our first question here. Oh, and I'm going to drop. All right. Uh, this question, um, I've been nervous to try your products because I've had contact dermatitis from unrefined shea butter as chapstick. Is the shea butter in Sweet Spot Labs less likely to cause issues somehow? So first of all, let me give a disclaimer. Um, there's not specific products that I endorse, if you will. Um, I have put a variety of well-tolerated products on my Amazon storefront just because everyone keeps asking me, can you give me recommendations? Can you tell me what a sits bath looks like? Um, can you show me what some vulvar emollients or moisturizers are? What options do I have to choose from? And so instead of responding with separate direct messages um, or putting it in a post that gets kind of filtered down um, and loses a bit of attention, I decided to create an Amazon storefront. Um, so these are not necessarily my products. These are just products that some of my patients have tried and some of the support groups um, have tried and have reported on. So I'm just the reporter. Um, as far as different products, everybody is an individual. And so what works for one person may not work for another. For example, I love Aquaphor. However, Aquaphor has lanolin in it. So if you're sensitive to lanolin, then Aquaphor is not the emollient for you. Um, same with Vaseline. Vaseline is a great 
less expensive option. It works very well. Um, however, if you're sensitive to petroleum jelly or you don't like the feel of it or it doesn't agree with your skin for some reason, then that's not the vulvar moisturizer for you. There are other products that are designed for vulvar health. Um, some of the um, there's some benefits to some of these products and then there's some downsides to some of these products. And so I, I encourage everybody to look at the ingredient list. Um, you need to look at the ingredient list to see what you may be sensitive to so you can make an informed decision. You may want to trial a product on your forearm first just to make sure that there's not a reaction um, in general to your skin. If you've had sensitivity skin testing with an allergist or an immunologist, then you want to pay attention to the product list. Um, unfortunately, some of it is a bit trial and error, just like face creams and face serums. Um, so I encourage you to um, just be careful because what works for other people may or may not work for you. Uh, I've had lichen sclerosis for 34 years and differentiated VIN3 four times over the past 12 years, despite using clobetazole and estrace. Are there any other treatment treatments on the horizon? Um, first of all, I'm so sorry that you've been through all of that. We do know that vol uh, lichen sclerosis does have a um, as increased associated risk for vulvar precancer. So that's BIN or vulvar intraepithelial neoplasia is what that stands for. That's graded um, on the basis of VIN 1, 2, three, based on the depth of the abnormal cells, um, based on biopsy and um, read by a pathologist. And then after that is carcinoma in situ, which is CIS, followed by invasive vulvar cancer. Um, our goal is to, uh, is to obviously prevent vulvar intraepithelial neoplasia as well as vulvar cancer. And if something does progress to VIN, we want to identify it and then excise it because that's the treatment. So it doesn't pro uh, progress to invasive carcinoma. Um, as far as um, treatments on the horizon, we do have some treatments on the horizon, actually. Um, so we're doing a clinical trial right now. We're doing a randomized control trial that's placebo controlled. So basically, it's a, um, a topical cream that's a what's called a JAX inhibitor. So there's some research that we did about two to three years ago, looking at the genes that were upregulated and downregulated in lichen sclerosis. And through that research, we found which genes are targeted um, in the process in the autoimmune process of lichen sclerosis within the skin. And this led to a targeted treatment and actually a drug company reaching out saying that they had a targeted treatment for the process that we identified. Um, and so we are trialing that right now. Um, we were in the midst of the study. So um, the study is completely blinded. So I don't know which participants have the actual active vehicle or the study drug versus the participants that have the placebo or just the base without the study drug in it. Um, so I don't know. Um, so I don't have any results to share with you yet, but we're hoping to conclude the first cohort probably in the summertime, but these results probably will not be analyzed and released um, until probably next year. So 2024. Um, but this is exciting. It's a non-steroidal topical JAX inhibitor. So we're very excited about its mechanism of action. And we're excited about the potential for a non-steroidal treatment for um, lichen sclerosis. So I'll keep you updated as we have information on that. So lots of things to look forward to. Cool. I just want to make sure I let everybody know, drop your questions in the post that says drop your questions here. Just hit comment, drop your um, questions in there, and then we will get them to Dr. Kraft. All right, how long does it take for the condition to progress? Um, by that, I mean, how long does it take to show the first symptoms like tearing and how long does it take for signs to show like white patches? So this is a really difficult question to answer um, because there's not, everyone's a little bit different and we actually, there's not a standardized 
time course um, for progression. Because this is an autoimmune condition, we think that someone has a propensity and then there's certain environmental um, outside factors that probably bring it out and inside factors as well. So every the things that affect the immune system are going to be um, diet, hormones, um, environmental exposure, stress, um, and so forth. There's a lot of different things that affect the immune system. So it, there's a genetic predisposition, and then there is a series of factors that bring this out or make it potentially more symptomatic or even less symptomatic. So unfortunately, there's there's not a, a quoted time course that I can give you for progression. Um, if someone is using a treatment that's suppressing inflammation at the bottom of the skin, so whether that be a topical corticosteroid, whether that be um, an a, immunomodulator like tacrolimus, or whether that be um, with diet and uh, stress reduction and so forth, whatever is decreasing that inflammation, um, if the inflammation levels are kept at bay and suppressed, then there's less likely to be progression, um, less symptomatology, um, and less progression of scarring. So um, that's the, the idea. And our goal with treatment is to decrease inflammation. How can you avoid symptoms during sexual intercourse and can topical steroids make the symptoms worse? Okay, great. Um, so great question. So how can you um, avoid symptoms during sexual intercourse? So when I think of lichen sclerosis, there's two buckets of symptoms that I think of. So lichen in Latin means thickening, um, whereas sclerosis in Latin means scarring. So there's the sclera, there's the, excuse me, the lichenification or the thickening of the skin due to inflammation leading to uh, uh, disjointed collagen synthesis. Um, and that's creating the itching and the patches and the roughness of the skin and the change in skin texture that we look for in the exam. Um, and then the inflammation also causes skin to stick together that typically wouldn't. And that causes the scarring changes. The sexual uh, effects tend to be related to scarring um, because it tends to be um, fusion at the top and the bottom of the vaginal opening, which can narrow the vaginal opening. Um, that tissue, that scar tissue tends to be thin as opposed to active lichen sclerosis skin, which tends to be thicker. And so that thinness of the scarring is what can tear. Um, it doesn't have a good blood supply. So that tissue isn't very healthy. And so it can tear and then it refuses and then it tears and refuses and so forth. Um, and so avoiding symptoms of tearing and tightness and pain with intercourse related to scarring, um, they can be avoided by um, a conservative measure like a um, by scar tissue mobilization, where we basically need out the scar tissue over time. Um, we can also bring health back to the tissue. Um, if the tissue needs hormones, sometimes we can do a topical estradiol, or an, which is estrogen or an estrogen testosterone combination. Um, we can also have help to increase blood supply to that tissue in, in a variety of ways. We want to check the muscles underneath to make sure they're not too tight um, uh, to optimize blood flow. There's yoga-based hip openers that can help with that. Um, so there's many options that we have to decrease pain and tearing during intercourse, um, some related to the actual tissue and some related to the muscles underneath. A lot of people recommend soaking in borax bath. Um, how do you feel about this? This is the million dollar question. Everyone always asks me this. So here's, here's the thing. Um, so I was trained in Western medicine, but I fully recognize that there are naturalistic approaches and I do try my best to to advocate for those. I think that there is a strong influence of diet with how our immune system works, both our whole body immune system and our immune system within the skin layers. Um, so with borax, the, the, the only thing, it's a salt, right? And so there's no research on it, um, which makes it very difficult for me to have an opinion um, from a 
scientific standpoint. Um, if someone would like to use that method, I'm not going to tell them not to. I don't recommend ingesting borax, um, but soaking in it is similar to soaking in Epsom salt. Um, it may be more effective. Uh, I would love for there to be research on this. There just is not research. The other thing is that it's difficult to do research on this because um, there's been guidelines that have put, been put out by the leaders um, in some of these um, arenas saying that it's strongly recommended not to soak um, with borax. I find for my patients, we're able to decrease inflammation with FDA approved um, medications um, that have a strong research background, um, a, a physiologic basis. And I know it, it, um, in research, it shows that it prevents vulvar carcinoma, whereas I have no research that shows that borax soaks um, decrease vulvar cancer. And so for me, it's really difficult um, to provide a recommendation. I think that if you choose to have that as an adjunct, then I'm fine with that. And some of my patients decide to do that. But as a medical professional, it's really difficult for me to advocate something that has no research basis. I hope that makes sense. I do support everybody that, um, you know, would like to try naturalistic methods. Will clobetazol still work if you mix it with a little bit of emu oil to make it more spreadable? Yes, it will. That's completely fine. Um, it's an active ingredient in a base. Um, so you can absolutely do that. And it's completely fine. All right. Let's see. Most my most symptomatic area is the groin or the bikini line. I've been told LS in this area is rare, um, but can it affect that area? Okay, so I'm going to talk in kind of um, broad terms. So in general, we do not see LS in the groin area or the bikini line. However, I have seen LS in this area. It's definitely uncommon. Um, you really need to see a, um, a specialist just to see what it is. Um, the most common thing that we see in the groin area is actually tinea curis, which is yeast um, in the groin area. It usually appears red. Um, it can have a bit of a flaky texture. It's itchy. Um, and so if it looks more of a red color, if it has a little bit of a flaky texture, um, everything itches. So that's hard to determine. But um, then Lotrimin um, AF is usually what I'll use. It's over the counter anti yeast, try that first. And if it doesn't clear up with that, then, um, you know, you consider you can consider other options. But in general, it does not affect the groin area. How can I tell when I'm in remission? Would being in remission change my treatment plan or frequency of application? I'm currently using it three times a week. Okay, I can't give you individualized medical advice without actually looking and seeing if you're in remission. However, I can answer the question about remission. So remission is a term that we as doctors use to describe when the skin texture is healthy. So when there's no like lichenification or thickening of the skin when I look during the exam, um, then we say that you're in remission. You can still have hypopigmentation or whiteness. So that whiteness may, may or may not improve. Um, you can still have scarring. You can still have, you can still be extraordinarily symptomatic. Um, usually if you're in remission, you don't really have the itch per se, but the scarring effects can be symptomatic. Um, I can't with my eyes see the level of inflammation under your skin. I wish I had x-ray vision and I could, but what I can see is the aftermath of it. So the thickness or the texture of the skin gives me a general indicator of what's going on below the surface. It's kind of like looking at, you know, rough seas versus calm seas. Um, and so uh, remission essentially just means that there's a low level of inflammation under the surface. And that's our goal. Um, maintenance therapy is typically twice a week. Uh, when my LS flares, it's red. Should I add more steroid when I get red? Oh, that's a really tough one um, because there's other conditions that can be superimposed on lichen sclerosis that can result in flares, okay? Um, the other thing is that uh, topical steroids, um, as well as they do work, every medication, every medication has 
upsides and downsides, risk and benefit. Um, and so one of the downsides potentially of, of topical corticosteroids is it affects the local immune system by decreasing inflammation. But one of the kind of side effects of that is it decreases the immune system response to keeping yeast or bacteria at bay sometimes. Now this is uncommon, but we do see it, especially if a steroid is being used a little too much or if it's not being used in really like the correct manner, like if it's not absorbing completely or if it's sitting on the surface, we see increased risk of superimposed, meaning on top of the lichen sclerosis, superimposed vulvar yeast. Um, or potentially a cellulitis, which is like a bacterial infection of the skin on top of lichen sclerosis. So when something looks angry and red and it kind of comes out of the blue, really you need to see a doctor um, to differentiate between if it's superimposed yeast, if it's a bacterial infection, or if it's an upsurge um, of the lichen sclerosis. Clobetazole makes my vulva white and flakes everywhere. <laughs> what can I use instead? Okay, um, clobetazole is not for everyone. There's many different options when it comes to bases and um, potencies of topical steroids, in addition to making sure they're being used in the correct way. There truly is an art to this. Um, it's not just about the medication and just getting a prescription or a tube of steroid. It's about how you use it, how you're instructed to use it. And I totally get that a lot of you have not received very good instruction on this. I completely understand. Um, that's why we have, you know, webinars, we have podcasts, we have everything. Now, that being said, it's not a one size fits all approach. That's why I see patients, I get their history, I do a full physical exam, I do a vulvoscopy, I have to individualize everything to each person. Um, but I do, I don't want you to be out there, you know, um, without any help at all. So I totally get it. Um, if clobetazole is not working for you, you need to see your doctor um, so you can see what other options exist. Perhaps a lower potency steroid, perhaps um, trying to figure out if there's a superimposed process on top of it, perhaps seeing if um, there needs to be further instruction in how you're applying it. Do you have recommendations for hair removal? Um, if there isn't active lesions, um, is waxing okay? What about home products? So I actually have a, I have a video and a post about this exact topic. Um, there's not a ton in the research, but what we found is that laser hair removal is probably the best method for hair removal with lichen sclerosis. Now remember that question that we had before, usually lichen sclerosis does not affect the groin creases. And so hair removal in the bikini line is generally completely fine. Um, and you can do whatever hair removal option you feel comfortable in um, with in that area. Um, it, what I would be careful with, um, with waxing, uh, there's something called sugar waxing, I believe, which is preferable to strip waxing. Um, but just be careful about the clitoral area, the clitoral prepuce, um, and the clitoris. I did have one patient who had an unfortunate, um, event with that where um, the wax was all over the clitoral area and she did have fusing um, because she had some active lichen sclerosis there. We were able to treat her. Everything's fine now, but that, that does make me a little bit weary of waxing in that area. But again, your bikini line is completely fine, whatever you choose. And then um, laser hair removal is likely the preferred method in the setting of lichen sclerosis. Are there any studies that look at both autoimmunity and LS? Um, I'm looking for ways to intervene upstream, not just locally. Yeah. So yes, there are studies um, that look at autoimmunity and LS. Um, they're pretty technical. Uh, you know, when we were writing up the paper that we wrote, I, I think like for the background resources, I read them like 10 times. I mean, this is all bench research and very complex. Um, I think you're asking like, what can I do from like an immune strengthening standpoint, right? Um, so, you know, it's the things that we talk about for anything. So um, 
whole healthy whole food diets, um, avoiding processed foods. If you're gluten sensitive, av avoiding gluten, um, you know, trying to eat as clean as possible, exercise, stress relief through exercise, mindfulness, meditation, um, all of these things help our immune system um, to, you know, so, so I think that all of these things that we usually talk about for strengthening the immune system can all help with lichen sclerosis as well. Um, we do want to optimize the hormone um, there. If you're postmenopausal, you may want to consider a topical estrogen. Um, in that area in the vestibule um, or the vagina as well, just to um, just to help with the tissue. Can LS cause petechia on the buttocks? Ah, uh, okay. So that's that's like a confusing um, question because petechiae are basically red dots. And there's a lot of different things that can cause that a drug reaction, allergic reaction, contact dermatitis, um, satellite lesions from candidiasis or yeast infection. So can it possibly but does it I mean, we have to do an exam to really know that. Um, I would look in, you definitely need to see someone like a gynecologist or a dermatologist to diagnose. I heard calcineurin inhibitors cause cancer. N no, um, no, calcineurin inhibitors do not cause cancer. Um, you know, what has an increased risk of cancer is, is untreated um, inflammatory conditions. So calcineurin inhibitors decrease inflammation. Uh, so that is, that's not true to my knowledge. I have biopsy confirmed lichen sclerosis and was recently diagnosed with bulbodynia. I also have the occasional yeast infection. When I have a symptom such as, say, irritation, it can be challenging to know what, which, whether it is, oh, whether to call my provider or just push through it. Okay. All right. So, um, so first of all, vulvodynia, um, I know that people receive a diagnosis of vulvodynia, and I think that receiving a diagnosis of vulvodynia is a good start. Um, and if your doctor has diagnosed you with vulvodynia, it's great that they're thinking about these things and locating where exactly where the pain is and giving credence to it. That's the first step. We need um, codes like that for research purposes and, um, and for awareness. However, um, I think the next step that I'm hoping for is that we go one step further. Vulvodynia refers to a chronic pain or an abnormal pain response of the vulva. And that's pretty broad. There's a lot of things that can cause vulvar pain. Um, it's typically something that is not a known entity. However, everything has a cause. And as we learn what the causes of chronic vulvar pain are, we can give a more specific diagnosis. For example, for example, chronic vulvar pain or vulvodynia can be related to hormones, can be related to nerves, can be related to muscles, and can be related to inflammatory conditions. And so um, we really need to take one step further and find out exactly what the underlying cause is. Um, so, hope, so as far as like what, you know, how to separate these things, it's really difficult. Even as a provider, it's difficult. Um, so, you know, um, I'd have to do an exam to really, that's what I do every day is to separate <laughs> these pain generators to come up with, uh, to give people diagnoses and to give people a targeted treatment plan um, that's going to work um, because it's based on root cause instead of just generic where the pain is. Um, do you have studies coming up? I always have studies. Um, we just published, uh, it came out yesterday or today. There's a systematic review on sexual um, effects of lichen sclerosis. It was published in Sexual Medicine Reviews. Um, so that's out now, um, just came out. Do we have studies coming up? Um, yes. So we're currently doing the study I told you about. We have a study that's in the preliminary stages. I'm writing the protocol for it on um, a shockwave device for overactive pelvic floor muscle dysfunction. Um, so we have that going. There's a potential for a, another chance at botulinum toxin um, for hypertonic pelvic floor. So hopefully, because we need insurance approval for this. Um, so we're trying our best to do these um, randomized control trials. Um, 
as far as other studies coming up, um, we're, we're, I just met today with a couple other researchers. We're looking at lichen sclerosis in people of color. And so you're gonna hear more about that. That is something that definitely needs more attention. Um, so we're really excited about that study. It's gonna be a qualitative study um, to understand people's experiences. So I'm very excited about that. We also submitted a paper on lichen sclerosis in pregnancy um, to give some guidelines for that because we have no research um, so hopefully that answers your question. We have a ton of things going on right now. Um, how can you differentiate only VIN1 or LS and VIN together or only LS in the same vulvar biopsy or clinically? Okay, so this is where it gets a little tricky um, because VIN1 um, can be differentiated or undifferentiated. So VIN1 that's related to HPV or human papillomavirus is also known as genital warts. Um, sometimes we'll actually see genital warts, right? But sometimes we have to do, sometimes people just have itching and the skin looks normal. And then we do a vulvoscopy with a bit of um, acetic acid and the skin turns bright white and that shows VIN1. VIN1 um, that's undifferentiated due to HPV is does not progress to vulvar cancer. Um, and it's typically treated with, uh, with Aldera or Imiquimod. Again, by a specialist, you need a diagnosis for that. Um, differentiated VIN one, two, or three does progress, can progress, can progress to vulvar cancer. It doesn't always, but it can, it has the potential to do that. Um, the percentage of progression to cancer depends on the level. So VIN one is less likely to, VIN two more likely, VIN three most likely, right? Um, and so differentiating VIN, so LS is, so LS is a separate diagnosis, but VIN is at a higher risk in the setting of lichen sclerosis because the inflammation leads cells to make mistakes, and that's what can turn into a precancer or a cancer. So again, you need a vulvar biopsy. You need a specialist um, to give you a treatment um, regimen or protocol or excision um, in these cases. Recently diagnosed at 59, but I, I believe I've had it for many years. So angry at specialists and GPS that, uh, and GPs, excuse me, that would have seen it, but never let me know. I have labial resorption, which is listed as severe. Okay. Yeah. I, um, oh, along with cancer. Sim uh, okay. All right. I'm sorry. I don't really understand the, the question very well, but um, I understand that your lichen sclerosis has been missed um, and mi probably misdiagnosed. There is a five-year lag in diagnosis um, reported in literature, but we all know that could be much longer um, or it can be shorter for some people. And I know this is very frustrating. I totally, totally understand. Um, I think that the difficulty lies in that it's a condition that is caught between two medical specialties. So you have you know, our dermatologists that are trained in this and learn about this, um, but they're not always looking at the vulva. And then we have, um, and then we have gynecologists who see vulvas every day, all day, but they don't always have the training um, or the experience to recognize or diagnose or treat like in sclerosis. So I totally understand. Um, as far as how we're going to move this forward, I think it has to do with awareness, which we're doing a good job at, and I think we can continue to improve. Um, it's going to be teaching residents um, within OBGYN, as well as dermatology, about these conditions, um, even general practitioners, so they can identify and refer appropriately. Um, and so I'm hoping that that improves in the future, but I completely understand your frustration with everything. When, cl when clobetazole doesn't improve symptoms, how do you um, proceed with a patient? Yes. So there's a couple of ideas here. Um, the first off, uh, um, first of all, clobetazole is not the only topical steroid choice that we have. Sometimes clobetazole is too strong of a steroid. Um, I tend um, 
sometimes I don't use it in the perianal area because of that sometimes, um, cause it can cause some irritation. So I'll use a lesser steroid in that area. Some people can't tolerate an ultra potent, um, topical steroid, so I'll use a less potent topical steroid. The other thing is that clobeta is all, you have to look at the base. So, um, if you're allergic to parabens, like if you break out in a rash every time you put a sunscreen on, or you had allergy testing and you're, you have an allergy or sensitivity to parabens, then a lot of these topical clobeta is all included, does have, it has parabens. And so we have to look for a topical steroid that, that doesn't like mometazone doesn't have parabens. So sometimes it's a, it's a troubleshooting um, with the base. I have in the past, just a handful of people I've compounded um, a topical steroid like clobetazole um, in a base that's non-allergenic, um, depending on someone's profile after allergy testing. I've only had to do that less than five times. I can count on one hand how many times I've had to do it. So it's very uncommon. The most common thing that I see is that um, people are not um, because they haven't been given proper instruction, they're not correctly applying the medication. So it's a less issue with the actual medication and more of an issue with application technique. Um, the alternatives to a topical steroid, say someone cannot tolerate any topical steroid at all, our second line is going to be um, our calcineurin inhibitors, which are immunomodulators like tacrolimus or pimicrolimus. Um, the only downside with those, there's two downsides. One, they burn when you apply them um, at first. Your skin does get used to it, but it's uncomfortable at first. And second, they have to be applied um, at more, um, a more of a frequency. So it's like it can be twice a day as opposed to twice a week. Um, as far as other options, there have been some experimental options that have been um, evaluated. However, we don't have enough research behind them to recommend them as first or second line options. Um. Could Dr. Graf comment on the incidence of lichen planus and is the treatment similar to lichen sclerosis? Great question. We always talk about lichen sclerosis, but we don't always talk about lichen planus. Um, so lichen planus is an autoimmune skin condition similar to lichen sclerosis. It's T cell mediated, um, but instead of causing thickening of the skin, um, it causes erosions. So the top layer in different areas of the skin are is essentially like denuded or it comes off. Um, and so it's kind of like having an ulcer in your cheek or in your mouth. And, and to go along with that, lichen planus can be found in the oral um, mucosa. Um, it tends to affect mucosa, meaning um, if you think about your mouth, the inside of your mouth, if you kind of think about the vagina, um, it tends to affect the vestibule, which is the entrance to the vagina, and then it can affect inside the vagina as well. The issue with lichen planus is that if you have erosions on both sides of the vagina, um, because that skin doesn't have a good skin barrier, they can stick together um, in the vagina and they can cause um, adhesions or scar tissue formation that can um, cause scarring inside the vagina and limit the length of the vagina and cause pain with intercourse and so forth. So um, there is a, a um, so hopefully that the, the question was about prevalence. So it's less prevalent than lichen sclerosis. We don't know the true prevalence of lichen sclerosis and we don't know the true prevalence of lichen planus, um, but it certainly is less common than lichen sclerosis. How do you generally treat lichen sclerosis in pregnancy and how can it affect tears during childbirth? Okay, great question. So we are, we just submitted or we're, we're about to submit um, the, our research on this um, to the Green Journal, which is the um, OBGYN journal, uh, one of the big ones. Hopefully they accept it um, and value lichen sclerosis. I really hope they send that message. Um, but basically, um, lichen sclerosis, we have very little research on lichen sclerosis in pregnancy. Um, we do know that it's safe to use a topical um, corticosteroid in pregnancy. Um, so I usually, you know, if someone's on maintenance, um, typically during pregnancy, the immune system kind of quiets down because the baby is like a foreign body. So the immune system has to kind of um, quiet down to allow the baby to stay, you know, to, to grow and, and, and not be rejected. Um, so a lot of autoimmune conditions actually improve um, in pregnancy. We see this across the board and lichen sclerosis, um, it typically happens. Now that's not always the case, but that's typical. 
typically what it is. And so sometimes I'll decrease the topical steroid from twice a week to once a week um, because of that, because symptoms are improving. As far as tears during childbirth, if lichen sclerosis is in remission, um, then you know, it's the tearing should not be more severe than typical tears. What we found with the study is that patients did not have more severe tears um, compared to general population um, when we're looking at different degrees of tears. So we didn't see an increased incidence of third and fourth degree tears, which are tears into the anal muscles or into the anus itself. Um, if I'm in remission, um, do you still recommend using a cream daily? I've had a lot of irritation in the perianal area and using the steroid cream three times a week. Okay, um, so if you're in remission, I do still recommend maintenance dosing. Um, I recommend an ointment over a cream generally and maintenance dosing is typically um, twice a week. Is there a role in an autoimmunity diet in the management of LS? So yes, I, I do think there is a role. Um, I think that everyone's going to respond a little bit differently, um, but I do think that diet is very important in our immune health. Um, and so there's not a specific diet, unfortunately, that I can recommend because the research is very, very poor on that. But eating eating whole um, foods, uh, avoiding gluten if you're sensitive um, or have a, um, a gluten allergy. Um, these things are important. Um, there's also been some uh, talk about oxalates. Um, the research, like I said, it's poor in these areas, but I do think diet does play a role and I'm hoping in the future we have more research in this area. Is there a common protocol for treating stubborn vulvar yeast when the skin is immunosuppressed by clopidazole? Um, there's not a standardized protocol for it, um, but I typically give a combination of oral anti-yeast medication as well as topical anti-yeast medication. One moment. Is, is there a relationship is there a relationship between lichen sclerosis and constipation? Um, relationship, uh, not a direct relationship, but there's an indirect relationship. So if someone has lichen sclerosis, it's possible that they have a bit more muscle guarding, especially if they're very symptomatic. Now, not everyone has this, but it's a possibility. And um, one, one moment, sorry. It's okay. So everybody, we have tons of questions. I am working my way through them. I don't think we have, we have a less than 20 minutes. I don't think we're going to get through all of them, but you guys have been amazing. Thank you so much. Go ahead. Okay, sorry. My daughter, my four-year-old was in here like roaming around. She wants me to sing her a song for bedtime. Um, all right. So let's see. Is there a relationship between LS and constipation? I think we do. So, so not a direct, but indirect. So um, what we can see is we can see if there's active lichen sclerosis around the anus, there can be fissures or tears. Um, and that can obviously cause pain and itch as it's healing. And then that pain can lead to holding in stool and that can lead to constipation. Um, so yeah, we typically do see these things together, but there's not a direct association. Um, it's important to increase fiber, drink plenty of water, consider pelvic floor physical therapy to increase the function of the muscles. What problems can happen from using too much clobetazole or using it too frequently? Well, there's a couple issues. Um, number one, if clobetazole is not rubbed in adequately or if there's too much, if you're using too much of it, it can rub off on the tops of the, your thighs and it can cause thinning of that skin, which can cause purple stretch marks called stri striae. Um, we can see we can see thinning of the skin if there's too much clobetazole used. Um, we can see superimposed yeast or bacterial infections if there's too much clobetazole being used. Is clobetazole safe for lichen sclerosis and HPV? Um, safe, yes, but again, we have to 
is it safe for LS? Yes. Okay. Um, but for HPV, um, if there's HPV effect or genital con uh, warts, then a topical steroid can potentially make those worse if they're present. Now those can, you can do cryotherapy or freeze them. You can excise them. There's met topical medications that you can use for genital warts. Um, or for VIN1, like we talked about before, that would be undifferentiated, the HPV one. Um, but, you know, again, this is where decision making comes in with your um, doctor to determine what the best treatment regimen is for you, given what's going on. Once a patient is being optimally treated and on maintenance dose of a topical steroid, how often do you recommend they see their doctor for monitoring or to check for precancerous lesions? So generally we say every six months to once a year. Um, I think it depends on um, how long someone's been in remission, how comfortable they are, um, uh, you know, how experienced their specialist is or how experienced their doctor is. Um, I generally, I have patients travel to see me from, from all over the place, right? So what I generally say is come to see me once a year, see your local gynecologist once a year for your, you know, breast exam, mammogram, pap, what have you, um, and stagger that by six months. So someone is looking at your vulva every six months. Once a year, that's me. Once a year, it's your general doctor. Um, yeah, uh, rocks, yes. Um, the commercial version is made with propylene glycol. Does Rux cream? Okay. Yes, it does. Um, so that obviously is a consideration um, for if you have a propylene glycol sensitivity. If you just had a biopsy, can you still use clobetazole? Um, it's not dangerous. It just delays wound healing. So um, I don't recommend using clobetazole directly on the biopsy site until the biopsy heals. So I generally have people apply it um, in other places, but just put a little bit of Vaseline or Aquaphor on the biopsy site to allow it to heal for about two weeks or so until the stitches dissolve. I do put stitches in for better wound healing. Um, and then um, after it's healed, you can use the clobetazole. It's not dangerous though. My understanding is that regular sexual arousal um, and increased blood flow can help, help offset a, um, atrophic changes from lack of estrogen. Um, all right. So yes, um, it's true that increased blood flow brings nutrients, oxygen um, into tissue to, to help keep it healthy um, to a certain point, right? It's helpful, but for some people that may be enough. For other people, they do need local low dose hormone like estrogen. Yeah, the um, question yeah. is, would it would it also be the same? Would it have the same effect for LS? Oh, um, so remember, LS is an issue of too much inflammation in the bottom layer of the tissue. So you can increase blood flow, but it's not going to decrease inflammation. So um, although it may help with the health of the tissue, um, it's not going to target the underlying process. I'm not far into the disease. I still have half of us, half of small labia and so my opening is open. Uh, some say I should go to physiotherapy, but I do not see sense in that. What do you say? I can't give um, individual medical advice. Um, you know, if you have hypertonic or overactive pelvic floor muscles, um, then it would be helpful to go to physiotherapy. If you need guidance for dilator therapy, then it would be helpful to go to physio. Um, but really, you need like a reason and a goal um, for all treatment options. These next two questions, um, I'm going to put them together, even though they're from two different people. Okay. Okay. Can you get LS? Yes, you can get LS under your um, breasts. Um, it's less common, but possible. I'm scared of LS spreading all over my body. Um, so it's it's uncommon to have it in other parts of the body. It's possible, um, but it's much, much less common. Um, and just because you have it on the vulva doesn't mean it's going to spread all over your body. Um, do I recommend the Fenton procedure or any other surgery to remove banding or fusions? Um, will surgery like this help to correct a recurrent tear? Okay. So when it comes to tearing um, in the introitus, if there's a scar tissue band or 
fusion, um, then you have a couple options. One option is more conservative. So it's scar tissue mobilization with perineal massage, either with your thumb or dilator therapy or an S wand. Um, so that's more of conservative option. Um, and then the other option, if that doesn't work, or if you choose would be a very minor surgical procedure to remove the scar tissue band. Um, so that's another option. Um, which option is right for you um, really needs to be discussed on an individual basis with a specialist who performs these procedures so they can inform you on the risk and benefit of each option. Um, two biopsy stated VIN can't be ruled out. Um, how common is this? Um, it's hard for me to say uh, how common it is. I So it depends who's reading your bio, the biopsy. So for example, I'm at a center where we see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of patients with lichen sclerosis. So when I do a biopsy, I send it to a dermatopathologist. It's someone who reads skin condition biopsies like all day, every day. And so I rarely get like, I rarely get reports of like, like this. Um, and if I did get a report like this, I would call that I have the pathologist cell phone number, I call them and we hash it out and we talk about it. And I put together my clinical picture with their, you know, histopathology picture. Um, so yeah, there's a lot to that. Um, I would definitely monitor and p potentially re biopsy or have the biopsy sent to a dermatopathologist. Is hyper hyperpigmentation with LS a concern? No. So hyperpigmentation is basically the immune system's like overdrive response to inflammation that was once present that's no longer present. So remember that increased inflammation at the bottom of the skin, um, how it uh, um, basically attacks the melanin in the skin, and that's what causes whiteness associated with lichen sclerosis. Um, sorry, I need to plug in my computer. It's about to die. Um, so if the inflammation decreases for whatever reason, um, whether it's with treatment or one of the other factors that we talked about, um, the body can deposit more melanin, um, kind of in reaction, and that can cause hyperpigmentation. So we see this very commonly on the labia minora, especially when they're resorbed. Sometimes I'll see it on the perineum or the bottom of the introitus. Um, and it's a sign to me, it's a very subtle sign that someone has lichen sclerosis, even if they're in complete remission and there's no other signs. I have LS in my 30s. Can I expect any relief post-menopause or are things going to get worse? Okay. So generally, if you're on a good regimen and you're in remission, um, you may have to add a topical um, hormone to the mix if you're after menopause. Um, but in general, um, it's completely manageable. Lichen sclerosis can get a bit worse after menopause if it's not adequately controlled, um, or it's possible that you may have to change your treatment regimen slightly to accommodate the decrease in hormone to the area. Um, but you know, it's, it's one of those things where you cross that bridge when you come to it, um, and you just kind of meet the condition where it is. Uh, what are the symptoms of anal LS? Um, okay, so it, it's similar to vulvar. So remember, lichen sclerosis occurs um, typically in a figure of eight pattern. That being said, some people just have perianal or in the intergluteal fold, which is our like scientific way of saying a crack, right? Um, some people just have it on the vulva, and some people have the fig the full figure of eight both areas. Um, but the symptoms are the same. How would one know whether some topical testosterone is needed along with clobetazole versus estrogen or in addition to it? All right, that's a tough one. Um, so the, the vestibule um, has many uh, androgen or testosterone receptors. However, there's, the research on this is emerging. So not everyone has really caught up with this. Um, so not all practitioners are going to feel comfortable prescribing testosterone off-label or compounding it, which is what we need to do here in the U.S., 
at this point, even though it's completely safe. Um, so whether you need some topical testosterone depends on the gland openings called the ostea. If they're red and irritated, if that's not relieved by estradiol on that area, then you may need an androgen in addition, but you may need to see a specialist um, who feels comfortable with that um, for prescription. Does Mona Lisa help with lichen sclerosis? Okay, so there were two big randomized control trials that were done. They were published in the Green Journal, which is like the big OBGYN journal. One of those studies was one of the studies I was involved in, and the other study was right across the, the street at Washington Hospital Center in D.C. So both studies came from D.C., which is kind of funny. Um, but they both looked at lichen sclerosis and the Mona Lisa. Um, they were both randomized um, control trials. However, the study I was involved in included biopsy before and after treatment. Um, both studies showed that the skin felt better and looked better, both from the patient perspective and the, clin and the clinician perspective. However, the biopsy showed no decreased inflammation before versus after the, mo the laser treatment. And this was, um, this was as identified by a blinded pathologist, not meaning the pathologist was blind, meaning the pathologist didn't know which patients were exposed to the laser versus the sham. Um, and so because of that, we can't recommend it um, as, as uh, it, we can't say that it decreases cancer risk. So we can't recommend it as first line treatment. Now, there are some very small studies and some others in the works looking at the potential of using a topical steroid along with laser treatment, because the idea is that laser um, basically creates micro perforations in the skin. And it's the basically that injury, that micro perforation that stimulates collagen, um, which makes the skin appear healthier. And so the idea here is if we combine it with a topical steroid, perhaps the micro perforations will allow the steroid to absorb better to get down to that lower level where the inflammation is located. However, um, my argument, we had a big journal club about this in the ISSVD, which is like the International Society for the Study of Vulva Vaginal Disorders. And we reviewed some of these studies and kind of talked about them because as specialists, we like to geek out on all this stuff. Um, but anyway, my response was, well, yeah, someone can go and get thousands and thousands of dollars of laser treatment to make a steroid absorb better or they can soak in a sitz bath for 10 to 15 minutes prior to application of the steroid, and that softens the skin and allows it to absorb better. So maybe there'll be a utility in the future for, um, for laser treatment, maybe in conjunction with one of these um, you know, treatments that are that's well studied, um, but we are just not there yet. Um, the one study that was published was pilot. Um, I think it had like 20 patients. Um, there's some more in the work. So we'll see. Um, there's some questions about lasers of different depths, and maybe that would help. But again, there's somebody um, there's somebody who offers like a laser PRP combination and talks about depths and, you know, uh, individualizing depths for lichen sclerosis. But this provider, ha this practitioner has never um, published <laughs> any of his studies. So it's not peer reviewed. It hasn't been critiqued. We don't know if it would work in other circumstances. Um, so we have a long ways to go um, with laser. Right now it's experimental. Could chronic vulvar atopic dermatitis cause fusing architectural changes? Um, no, not typically. So the level of inflammation with atopic dermatitis is not anywhere close to lichen sclerosis. Lichen sclerosis has more inflammation than psoriasis, eczema, any of these things. Um, and so they're kind of in different ballparks. Um, my OBGYN who doesn't specialize in LS wants to do a biopsy to differentiate between the two. Yeah. Um, a biopsy should tell you the difference between the two. You need to be off of a steroid for two weeks prior to the biopsy, or it can um, affect the results. Any research or knowledge of LS and genetics? Um, I think we talked about this. Uh, there is a genetic... Um, there is a genetic component to LS. We don't 100% understand it, but we do know that there is about a 16% chance of having mother, sister, or daughter um, with LS if you have LS. And then it can, boys can get LS as well. It's just much, much less common. Um, they typically get it on um, the foreskin, which 
um, can be removed with circumcision, um, which is generally the treatment. So, you know, um, they don't tend to be affected quite as much. Although that being said, there's definitely males on the Reddit board um, that are very vocal um, and are looking for treatments for lichen sclerosis. And I actually feel really bad because sometimes they'll reach out to me and I really, I'm a gynecologist. I really can't help them. And I feel so bad because I don't even know who to send them to. All right, this is going to be the last question uh, for the night. So the, there's two parts, but basically they're asking um, about having flares around their periods. Yeah. So this is really common. Um, there's two things to consider here. First, right before your period, estrogen levels drop. And so, um, and so you can get a bit more symptomatic from an itch standpoint because of decreased estrogen. Um, and then the other thing to consider is during your periods, uh, during periods, um, your sensation of pain increases a bit. So that can also explain why symptoms get worse right before and during periods. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Kraft. This was amazing. This is like rapid fire, man. I, know, I, I think you I did like. <laughs> I feel like I was doing the oral boards again. <laughs> you did amazing. You did amazing. So, um, everyone. Let me know, and I did not know any of your questions ahead of time. <laughs> no, she did not. No, she did not. You did a great job. Um, so, this replay will be up right uh, on, in our YouTube on our YouTube page um, and you'll be able to watch it here on Give Butter. So if you're like, what did she say? Watch the replay. And the replay from the earlier session will be um, up on our YouTube page tomorrow due to some technical difficulties. But um, again, thank you so much. If you found this helpful and you want us to keep doing things like this, hit that donate button give what you can, or at least leave us a little review. Let us know, um, leave us a testimonial that we can share. And uh, it helps us raise more money and do these things more often because we want Dr. Kraft to come back, right? <laughs> All right. Thank you guys. Have an amazing night. And uh, we will talk to you next time. Bye.